Okay, it's time for another round of content pot to follow up on some of the great content we've already gotten this morning from Rohit and Tamer. And I'm responsible for introducing the pods today, but I'm also actually the first pod. Um, so I am Jeff Cobb, and I'm going to talk about effective pricing practices. There's a story about the poet Gertrude Stein and just as an aside, I had no idea there was going to be so much poetry involved in this symposium, but I'm, I'm going to run with it. There's a story about the poet Gertrude Stein who, as she is lying on her deathbed, she looks up at her companion, Alice B. Toklas, and says, what is the answer? And after several minutes of silence, which I'm sure was awkward silence, Stein finally says, well then, what was the question? And I was reminded of that story as I started thinking about pricing and effective pricing practices because I think pricing is one of those areas of business where we all tend to grope for answers when we may not really be addressing the fundamental question as we're doing that. So we'll ask, you know, what are they willing to pay? What's the right price? What is the competition charging? How do we price when there's free in the market? And those are all good questions, but fundamentally, I think pricing is about how much control you have, how much control you can exercise in your marketplace. So I'd like to propose three, if not non-obvious, at least less obvious questions to ask about pricing to help you with implementing effective pricing practices in your organization. And so these three questions are gonna be, how can we change the category? How can we change the reference? And how can we change the offering? Uh, so I'll talk about each of those three a little bit in the next 10 to 12 minutes or so. So to explain a little bit by uh, what I mean by category, Every product that we introduce into a marketplace kind of falls by default into some sort of category. In the world of education, that's going to be things like, you know, conferences. Conferences is a category. Annual meeting might be a subcategory of conferences. Seminars is a category. Some organizations use online learning as a category. Personally, I think that's a mistake. That's too broad. That's too generic a category. It's going to set you up for pricing problems, but that's probably the subject of another pod. But in any case, you put yourself into a category almost by default. And by doing that, you inherit the characteristics of that category. So every category has what can be called an acceptable price range. So there's a range that we know that people are willing to pay for something like a conference. And we may not know the exact figure, but intuitively we know that if we go above a certain, a certain amount, we're probably going to lose just about everybody. And we also know in most cases, if we go below a certain amount, we're going to raise a lot of questions about the quality of what we're offering. And we may also lose a lot of people there. And we tend to inherit that acceptable price range. And then there are also the reference prices that our customers bring to the table when they're making purchasing decisions. So everybody who's going to buy for us has a reference price in mind. And it's based on conferences they've been to before, what they know is, is out there. And they all have their own conception of value. And we're inheriting that, too whenever we accept a default category with anything that we're putting into the marketplace. So the question then is, can we change the category? Can we make a completely new category for what we're offering? That's probably the best option, because in that case, you're not inheriting any acceptable price range. You're not inheriting any reference price. You're establishing those things. So can you change the category entirely, or can you at least change the dynamics of your category so much that you impact the acceptable price range and you impact the reference price. So practically speaking, what are examples of this? Well, if you think about Starbucks, Starbucks fundamentally changed the category of coffee shop. I don't know if they actually created a new category. I don't know if they just changed that category so much that it's practically unrecognizable, but what was an acceptable price range for coffee 25 years ago is not the acceptable price range now. And the reference price is no longer the reference price that it was 25 years ago. Starbucks fundamentally changed things. Another example is Dyson in the world of vacuum cleaners. 
Who knew that it would be necessary to pay $500 to $1,000 for a vacuum cleaner to do what a vacuum cleaner was supposedly supposed to do in the first place, which is suck up dirt? <laughs> but now, Dyson has fundamentally changed that category. Now, in the world of education, I think one of the, the prime examples of this in the past several years has been, you guessed it, TED. TED took the traditional conference and made it something different. The next TED annual event is going to happen in February. I think it's in Vancouver. Already sold out. I think it's been sold out for a while. You had to actually apply. I mean, you can't just go and pay to go to a TED conference. You've got to apply to be able to pay to go to a TED conference. And the current price of TED is $8,500. How many folks in the room are charging $8,500 for their conferences? Yeah. But this changed the dynamic of conferences. And TED didn't do anything terribly radical. I mean, it's still a conference. But we all know they shortened down the sessions. They turned the sessions into those, you know, 20-minute high-impact type talks that's influencing all conferences everywhere. In fact, it's influencing us right now as we're delivering this conference. They made it exclusive. They made it something special. And it gave them a lot of latitude over what they could do with the price. And they jacked that price way up. And it's continued to go up as the TED brand has exploded. So think for yourself, what could you do in the categories that you deal in to really change the dynamics of those categories or potentially even create a new category that's going to give you a lot more control over price? And again, control is the fundamental question. But let's say you look at the category and it's just clear we have to accept our default category. We're not going to be able to change it. We're not going to be able to radically change the dynamics of the category. What do we do then? Well, then you at least want to look at your reference price and say, can we influence this reference price in any way that's going to help raise the reference price over time and position us in a favorable way relative to the reference price? And there are a lot of ways that you can influence a reference price. I'm just going to suggest three today, and I like these three because they're mostly just about a change in mindset. They don't require re-engineering what you're offering, putting in new features, um, you know, investing a, a lot of money in new packaging or whatever the case might be. These are mostly just changes in mindset. So the first of these is going to be to simply raise your price. For whatever product in question that you're wrestling with pricing on, consider just raising the price. That's going to immediately impact the reference price in the market. It's going to start to have upward pressure on that reference price, and that's going to continue over time. So it's going to put you in a more favorable pricing position over time. But there's a trick to this. You have to raise the price enough to actually make a difference. There is what's called a zone of indifference around that reference price. And, and I should say as an aside, when I'm using these terms, acceptable price range, um, zone of uh, indifference, which I'll talk about more in a minute, and reference price. These are coming from um, Kent Monroe and Lillian Cheng, who I had the uh, pleasure to study with at the Pricing Institute. Um, but I found them to be very useful terms for talking about pricing. There is a zone of indifference around reference prices within which you can raise and lower prices, and most of your buyers just aren't even going to notice. They're not going to care. And actually, that in and of itself is good news because most of you could raise prices 5 to 10% on most of what you're offering, and nobody's going to notice, and your margins are going to go up. So that's good news. But if you really want to influence that reference price, you need to actually price outside of that zone of indifference so that it's actually noticeable, so that people actually know you're communicating something about price, uh, communicating something about the value that you offer out to the marketplace. And of course, there's some, there's some art here. Um, this is not a science. You'll have to test a little bit to figure exactly how high it gets you out of the zone of indifference so that people notice, but that isn't too high to completely price you out of the market. But if you do that, yes, you will lose some customers, but you're also going to gain others who now perceive your product in a positive way. And on the whole, raising price tends not to have a negative impact. In fact, has a positive impact on your margins, much more so than lowering price does. Never lower price unless you absolutely have to. So raising your price, that's the first thing to consider. The second thing to consider is doing what we call putting a magnet in the market. So in your portfolio of offerings, 
introduce something into that portfolio that is very high priced and very high value because that's going to have a magnet effect. That's going to pull up the perception of your other products and give you more latitude to raise the price of those other products. And I find that most organizations don't really have any sort of premium priced, premium value products in their portfolio. But this can be things like, you know, a very highly customized consultative training engagement on site at a client for which you charge a lot of money. And here's the trick, and maybe that nobody ever even buys that. Maybe you put that out there and say, that's $25,000 or that's $50,000. Um, you do have to be prepared to deliver on it, so you have to have a plan <laughs> for, for how you're going to do it. But even if nobody buys it, the fact that psychologically it's out there in your portfolio as a magnet is going to help you pull up pricing in your portfolio. So think about putting that premium high value product into your portfolio. The last one um, that I'll talk about is becoming non-generic. We all know that generic products don't command the same prices as branded products. But I would say, and I've been to most of the websites of most of the people in this room and looked at the training there, and most of it feels highly generic. In some cases, you're, you know, you're under the umbrella of your association's brand, but that brand is a little too diffuse to really extend itself effectively into your educational products. So you're really not benefiting from that and you feel like generic education and training out in the marketplace. So a couple of tips. One is to actively think about branding, naming, and putting a visual element with your education business overall, but certainly your major product lines. Make sure you're naming those and putting a visual element with them. And I want to give props to some organizations in the room who are doing that. And I apologize, I missed a few of you, I think, but I at least want to give props to the, the ones I caught here. Some organizations that have made a conscious effort to try to brand either their business or lines of products within their business. Um, so we've got the uh, administrative uh, professionals up here, administrative assistants up here. We've got the Illinois CPAs up here. We've got CAI, um, which does a great job with, with, with branding, and I, and I wish I could put the whole management advantage uh, graphic up here. Uh, we're going to have to get Colleen to talk about that at some point. Um, we've got the Florida CPAs up here, and we've got zero to three up here. In all cases, they've actually created a brand. And the thing about this is people don't say, I want some education and training. People say, oh, I want learn links. That's much more powerful. That's going to be a much better weapon against free than just simply having generic training out there that people can access. So there's a lot of power in a name. There's a lot of power in associating a visual with the name. So think about doing that. That's going to give you a lot more control over your pricing. And related to this, language is very powerful. This is one indication of language being very powerful. But think about how you're classifying your products, what you're actually calling your products. One of the biggest mistakes I think organizations make right now is around webinars, and some of you, of you have heard us say this before, that these days, if you want to sell a webinar and command any sort of price for it, the number one secret is don't call it a webinar. Everybody expects webinars to be either free or very cheap these days. So if you're calling your webinars webinars, stop. Call them virtual seminars. Call them virtual workshops. Come up with just about anything besides webinar and also get them under a nice brand for that product line as well and you'll have much more control over your pricing. So that's changing the category. That's changing the reference for the pricing. And then the last one I'm going to talk about is changing the offering. And the first thing I would say relative to this is to encourage you to think in terms of offerings not in terms of products. Because every product can really be multiple products. Every product can be configured in many different ways to be an offering. You can add and subtract value to create new ways to reach different customers with different refer reference prices in your market. So you always want to have a portfolio of pricing options out there and a portfolio of value out there for your potential customers to access. We're very big at talking about a concept we call the value ramp. Um, 
Hetagoras, and just the idea that there is a, a correspondence, a correlation between price and value, or there should be. Um, and you should be offering uh, uh, a portfolio of products that vary in the, the type of uh, value that they offer and the price should change with those. But very often, you're able to take something that's you know, on your value ramp and reconfigure it in various ways. And we've done this ourselves. We try very much to practice what we preach, but for years, we have offered a how to select uh, an LMS for your association webinar series. And, and that's something we offer for free. We're fine calling it a webinar because we're offering it for free. Um, and we do that a couple times a year, and we've actually developed some great content as a result of doing that. And we also know that there are people who want to go deeper uh, on that topic. So what we finally decided to do was take basically that core content that we had developed for that free webinar series and take it over to a platform where we could facilitate some discussion, where we could provide some supporting materials, where we could assign some you know, homework and that sort of thing. And we turned that into the Learning Platform Selection Bootcamp just based off of that core content that we already had, and then we just added some value for And we went from free for the webinars to $495 for the boot camp. And I know there's some people in the room who've actually participated in the boot camp. So that was just a, an instance of us changing the offering and being able to command a new price point with a new type of customer. Another example of this I've come across lately that I like a lot is the uh, American Academy of Neurology takes their conference content, which a lot of organizations are capturing their conference content now, but they'll take a piece of that content and treat it as kind of a flipped learning experience. So they'll sell you a package, taking a piece of the captured content around a particular topic that you can view on an on-demand basis, and then they're gonna have a live webinar that you can attend to go in, in depth on it with an expert and, and talk about it. And they call this their on-demand encore product which gives them a very attractive, high-value product that they basically configure out of content that they'd already produced as part of their annual conference. So this allows them to change the offering and to reach different customers with different price points and really maximize what they're able to do with their products and with their pricing strategy. So, fundamental question is control. And within that, asking, can we change the category? Can we change the reference? Can we change the offering? And if you sit down with the right people every time you're creating a product or reviewing your portfolio and actively ask and actively answer those questions, you are going to be engaging in the most effective possible pricing practices. Thank you.